Welcome back to our online continuation of our In Focus Town Hall. There is a lot facing this new Congress and we want to take the extra time to address all the issues and questions facing our state. And we do also want to thank our representatives and Senator Braun for sticking with us a bit longer here as we discuss some more of the questions that Hoosiers have tonight about that path out of the pandemic, but also other concerns that Congress yeah. will be debating. Yeah, let's begin here with a question from one of our viewers. This is from Terry in Indianapolis. This is her perspective on things. She asks, uh, some of the uh, lawmakers here tonight. Why do you refuse to aid your constituents who are in dire need while standing only with corporations who are not uh, addressing perhaps uh, some of the people who voted against this legislation in her question? Congressman Banks, uh, what's your response to to Terry and to those who might feel that way? Well, I'm, I'm proud, uh, Dan, that the Republican Party today for the first time in my life, maybe since the Reagan era, is the party of working people, the, par the, the political party that puts the interest of uh, the American working blue collar working people, which make up the bulk of the district that I represent. My, my family, my dad was a, is a retired factory union worker. And today the polls show that the Republican Party is the party of, of working people for the first time since Ronald Reagan. Why, why is that? Uh, it's because of, of the agenda that President Trump brought to the Republican Party over the last four years, a, a party that puts policies uh, uh, related to putting Main Street first over the interests of Wall Street, tackling the, the China threat. Um, all of that changed, though, on January 20th. We had, we had a president come to office in Joe Biden that is very pro-China, who's very pro-Wall Street. He's very pro-big tech. It's the opposite of what Republicans stood for over the okay. last four years. So uh, the agenda that I fight for in Washington, D.C. is is an agenda for working class people, for uh, small towns, for uh, for rural America, for agriculture, uh, a party and policies that stops uh, sending our jobs to, to China and sending our agriculture okay. to Mexico and instead okay. does it right here at home. And, and hopefully over the next couple of years, we'll have a debate about uh, which party represents which side of that coin. I know I know that I'm on the right side of those issues and we'll keep fighting for uh, for for Hoosiers and Hoosier values in Washington every single day. I know you'll continue to be a part of that uh, conversation in your new role uh, with the Republican Study Committee. Uh, Congressman Carson, I want to get your response uh, to some of the things Congressman Banks there. What's your perspective from across the aisle? Well, you know, I um, I supported the American Rescue Plan Act. Um, and you know, I, I, gone are the days where you'd have these contentious debates on the House floor, and after those debates, members of Congress, Republican and Democrat, would go out for drinks. Their families knew one another. Kids played together. I think you still have some of that. Uh, I'm a part of some of that, but it needs to happen even more so. You know, when you look at it more deeply, uh, Republicans and Democrats, we don't really disagree on much. I think our methodologies vary. Some of us are more wedded to philosophies, ideologies, and dogmas than, than the other. But I think at the end of the day, we all want better schools, safer communities, uh, jobs, 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 a strengthened economy, and wanting to move our country further and farther. And I think to the degree that we can do what's best for our constituents, I think all of us will do so. I think the corporate conversation has been mythologized. Uh, it's rooted in truth. But at the end of the day, we all want to be good stewards and representatives on behalf of our constituents. All right, Congressman, thank you. We do want to get to some of the other measures that are being heard in Congress right now. But before we do that, one quick question. We're going to bring back Representatives Jim Banks. The final version of COVID-19 relief bill that is headed to the president's desk has billions of dollars for veterans programs. It's said to be 17 billion. So as a member of the Veterans Affairs Committee, how do you see this helping or do you think it was necessary? $17 billion out of a $1.9 trillion deal. I mean, your, your question is laughable. I mean, if, if, if Democrats would have been willing to work with Republicans and spent money on veterans issues and supported the PPP program, even direct payments to the American people, Republicans would have worked with Democrats to write a bill that would do that. But a $1.9 trillion deal that only 1% of it went to vaccines only about 5% of the $1.9 trillion went to address the public health emergency that we find ourselves in the midst of today. The rest of this is a, is a wish list of Democrat special interest items uh, to, give, to give back to 
their special interests and has very little to do yeah, with addressing a, pa a pandemic. So yes, let's support veterans. Yes, let's support people who are unemployed. Yes, let's support those people who have been affected by the, by the pandemic. But $1.9 trillion deal that does very little to do that, it's an easy no vote for me. We thank all the members of the delegation who are sticking around for this online portion of our program. We do want to talk about some of the other topics our lawmakers wanted to tackle outside of the pandemic. Let's start with uh, Representative Trey Hollingsworth. Uh, Representative, this is Bob. I understand government reform initiatives. One of the issues you want to focus on in this session, what areas specifically do you think need reforming? All the way across the state, all the way across the district, I continue to hear them concerned about a Washington that hasn't for a long time felt representative of their values, of their wishes, of their goals. And I want to make sure we return to a Washington that truly reflects the greatness of the American people. We do that by reforming the way Washington makes policy, not by just individual policies, but by the way we make policy. Things like term limits, lobbying bans. I lead the House in both of those things so that we can change the way Washington works so we can get back to it working for the American people. Representative Jackie Wilarski, when it comes to uh, this new Congress, you mentioned to us that strengthening American manufacturing is high on your list. Obviously, you come from uh, a district uh, with a heavy amount of manufacturing, as you mentioned earlier. What areas are you specifically hoping to tackle and what problems uh, are, are people in your district facing right now, especially in the manufacturing industry? Well, there's a labor shortage, and I talked about that before, but we really need people to be able to merge back into, you know, working, moms going back to work because we figured out, you know, getting their kids back in school and they have childcare. And, you know, we've looked at all those issues. We've addressed all those issues over the last year and a half. And I think it's really important um, that we do everything we can to get people back in the workforce to be prosperous, to grow wealth, and to do what they want to do for their families. But, you know, I want to mention one thing. One thing that's holding everybody back in this country is Speaker Nancy Pelosi, who refuses to open the government, who refuses to open Capitol Hill, who refuses to allow members of Congress to come back to work on behalf of our districts, to work in a bipartisan way. You know, if we don't get back to the basics in Congress, you know, there's going to be very, very slow rollouts of things happening. So one of the reasons I got vaccinated was because I was told from our speaker, get vaccinated, come back to work. The reason uh, Representative Carson said we don't see each other is because the speaker doesn't let us on the floor at the same time. The blockade, what's happening is the most stringent partisan trifecta of power that we have ever seen as lawmakers and this country has ever seen. And therefore, that is a direct reflection of why our districts can't move ahead. Let's move now to another topic and bring in Representative Victoria Sparts. We talked earlier about this being your first term. You've told us broadband access is an area you really want to tackle this year. What problems are you seeing with broadband for your district? And also, what solutions do you think are possible? Well, I think, I mean, hopefully, you know, this would be maybe one of the issues that Democrats and Republicans actually can work together. I really hope. And I hope our, uh, you know, Secretary of Transportation from Indiana and our Chief of Staff of President Biden from in Indiana will actually work with the Indiana legislators and I reach out to them and I hope we can deliver it. Because if you look at the pandemic, the importance of access to high speed internet access, you know, on all of the communities became so important to have good education to have good healthcare and telehealth, and to have an ability to have business development and economic development. And I represent urban, suburban, rural areas. A huge issues with internet access in rural areas, but even suburban areas. Actually, mother of uh, Rod uh, Klein has issues in Carmel, he told me. So maybe we someday can talk with her boy what's happening in Carmel, but it's an issue. And I think it's an electricity of the 21st century. If we want to have a serious conversation in investing in the future, we should have high speed internet access and not looking at the past and try to put bandages on old problems without long term solutions. Another question now for Congressman Jim Banks. Congressman, this is Bob. I, I know that immigration is one of the topics that you're focusing on this year. Obviously, immigration is in the news just this week. What is your immigration plan and how will it benefit your district? Well, I mean, what's going on at the border right now is undeniably a 
a crisis. It's the first and biggest crisis on Joe Biden's watch as president. It's dr- directly related to executive orders that Joe Biden has signed since he's been president, just his first weeks on the job to reverse policies that worked that President Trump uh, signed into law when he was president. I'm talking about ending, uh, when, when President Trump ended catch and release, um, that that worked. That stopped, that stopped incentivizing illegals from trying to cross our border. And when Joe Biden signed an executive order reinstituting the Obama era catch and release policy, that's created an influx and a crisis at the border of those who are coming across across the border illegally or, or trying to. I mean, if you, all of us have seen the photos of of uh, illegals on the other side or, or, or those on the other side of the border trying to cross the border with Joe Biden T-shirts that look like look like Joe Biden's campaign logo, but it says Joe Biden let us in. Um, they they believe that the policies of this new administration are will, will welcome them, incentivize them to come in to America. And that's that's dangerous for our economy. It's it's dangerous. I've been down to the border to see the progress in the last administration and what they did to block the illegal drug flow, illegal drugs from coming to places like uh, uh, Indiana, Northeast Indiana that I represent, this, that devastates families and communities. We need to go back to the Trump era policies and immigration that worked and uh, stop this uh, madness that the Biden administration has ushered in, has created a crisis at the border um, that that needs to be addressed immediately. Well, let's talk about some of the solutions at this point. I mean, is it a matter of of building a wall? Is it a matter of just increasing security there and and stopping the flow of of children in many cases uh, right now into our country? Yeah, yeah, Dan, as I said, this is a policy matter. Yeah, the wall is, I believe the wall works. It's important. We should finish it. But one of the first actions on Joe Biden's watch was to stop construction of the wall. I've been down to see it. And the Border Patrol agents tell you that the wall works. It stops the cartels from bringing, from smuggling drugs over the border. Uh, but the, ca- the catch and release policy that, that, the, that the Biden administration reinstituted that caused a humanitarian crisis during the Obama administration and is causing a humanitarian crisis today at our southern border, it's because of the catch and release policy that says, come here and we're going to release you um, and and welcome and yet yet Joe Biden who campaigned on a um, on a platform of of, uh, of of doing exactly this and that's that's caused an influx at the border. By the way, you have more kids in in uh, facilities um, right now on Joe Biden's watch than you ever had at any point during the Trump administration. AOC called it kids in cages. I've asked AOC, what are you calling it now that there are more of them in these facilities on Joe Biden's watch? She hasn't answered me yet. But this is a humanitarian crisis at the border that is of Joe Biden's making. There's no there's no way around it. Let's open this up now to more of the delegation here. Earlier, Congressman Banks referred to this as a crisis. And during a daily press briefing, neither the press secretary or one of the convoys to this region called it a crisis, but did kind of urge people not to come into the U.S. How do we address this if the Biden administration won't use the terminology here that we've heard from Congressman Banks and perhaps even acknowledge some of the issues we're seeing? Let me start with Congressman Bouchon. Well, it is a crisis. I agree totally with Congressman Banks. And the reality, the reality is, is the other day, I just saw a statement that says, we want you to come, just don't come now. And, and you know, it's a, it is a human issue. Look, I, I empathize with people who are in dire circumstances, but the reality is to have a sovereign country, you have to do a, a number of things. One of those is you have to have sovereign borders. I mean, and you have to have a process for immigration into your country. And so just to not having any border security and just letting anyone come in uh, illegally and then catching them and giving them a court date for four years from now and releasing them into the United States, many of which, by the way, are positive testing for COVID. And they're going all over the U.S. I've been down there just as Congressman Banks and I suspect some of my other colleagues have. Uh, it's, it's honestly disturbing to see so many unaccompanied minors, these poor kids who have been sent to the border uh, during the Obama administration, primarily um, because uh, of the bad policies uh, that are in place. They are never going to admit that the policies of President Trump worked uh, and go back that direction. They just can't because the left wing of their party is just not going to allow it. 
But yeah. I can't think of another country in the world that would just allow this to continue to happen uh, without addressing border security yeah. first. And then, you know, we need to address some of our issues related to agricultural immigration uh, and how difficult it is to, if you want to be a legal immigrant, to come here. Um, but the Biden administration needs to reverse course and go back to what President Trump and that administration were doing where this is only going to get worse. Okay. And obviously this issue uh, has been a, a bit more front and center in the news this week. The White House holding a briefing today uh, on this topic, as Bershaw mentioned. Uh, staying with Congressman Bouchon right now, but switching topics, you're the vice chair of the GOP Doctors Caucus. And in the wake of this pandemic and the toll it took on our healthcare industry overall, what are some of the changes you want to see to better support healthcare workers moving forward? Well, let me just say, I mean, we've learned, we talked about this earlier when we were on uh, TV, but we, one of the things we learned is our public health system does, really needs bolstering, not only more money, uh, uh, but more people. And I agree at the local and state level and then coordinating with the federal government. So first of all, I think we've learned that. We've learned that even though we thought we were prepared, we weren't. For example, on testing, we just didn't, we just didn't have the ability to quickly ramp up testing and actually distribute that at the local level. We learned a lot about that and we've, and, and we've done better. So those are some of the things, you know, that, that we've learned. But, you know, healthcare workers, I was a surgeon before, need access to personal protective equipment. Our national uh, stockpile was depleted and not uh, repleted with new products. And also we were dependent on the Chinese for producing masks and other protective uh, equipment. We need to produce that here in America. So those are some of the things we've learned. I think we want to bring in uh, Congresswoman Wolarski into our conversation now. Um, Representative, again, thank you very much for your time. When it comes to this session, you mentioned that strengthening American manufacturing is very high on your list. What areas are you specifically hoping to tackle and what problems are your district facing right now as far as as far as industry is concerned? Sure. You know, um, for the last two years, I've been very involved in trade and specifically in the RV industry markets and trailers and those kinds of things. And, um, you know, we dealt with the trade and tariffs and different regulations around the world and different deals that are on, off, Chinese and you know, retaliatory, those kinds of things. I'm on the Ways and Means Committee. So those issues have been relevant and continue to stay relevant as we continue to evolve now with a different administration and different folks involved in conversations on trade and tariffs. So for me, trade tariffs and taxes um, is something that I am in 24 seven oversight, you know, um, with the Trump administration, we had great open doors to go in there and talk about fairness that you can't, uh, you know, have a, a one size fits all from Washington with all these trades and tariffs because it was affecting what we were doing, especially in the RV industry and then component parts and pieces that were made all over the state of Indiana and all over the country, you know, for a lot of small business those kinds of things can be very dangerous. And so one of the things that we were there all the time to talk to with the Trump administration was, you know, use and use uh, a scalpel on these decisions, not an ax. And then also to keep in mind that every single thing that we do that affects American and American jobs in the economy in my district is priority one. And so, you know, I've gotten very involved in it. I'm staying very involved in it and looking forward to seeing where the Biden administration is and continuing to fight for my district. Let's move now to another subject. Representative Hollingsworth, we do want to touch on an op-ed that you wrote earlier this month on the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. You called it anti-police and said law enforcement reform discussions need to include input from law enforcement. What reform policies do you support and do you think it's possible to have a bipartisan bill on this topic? I absolutely do think it's possible to have a bipartisan bill on this topic, but it requires bringing all of the stakeholders into the conversation. The anti-police rhetoric that we've seen out of the left is extremely dangerous. We've seen crime rates go up all the way across the country. And every single week when I meet with our Hoosier police officers and everyone that puts on a uniform bravely to keep us safe in our communities, what they say is they need more resources, more training, more help to deal with the many issues that they're seen all the way across our communities. They want to do the right thing for every single Hoosier, no matter what community they may live in. 
but they're stymied by many of the old practices and a lack of resources because we haven't brought them into the conversation. We haven't empowered them to do more to help Hoosiers feel and actually be safe in every community across our great state. Congresswoman Sparts, a question for you. You told us that you want to uh, focus on free speech and big tech. Um, that's obviously been a rallying cry the number of the past couple of years. Uh, what specifically would that look like as far as a legislative proposal? Just quickly follow up, Indiana State House, I have to do a shout out, just passed bipartisan unanimous police reform. So we actually can get it done in the state. And so I think if people work together and get things done. I also would like to mention an immigration, as a member of immigration subcommittee, we just had a press conference with my colleagues from border states. And they ask one thing, if they don't believe there is a crisis, President Biden need to come to the border and actually see what's happening. It's unhumane and it's un-American what's happening on that border. And we need to deal with this issue. As following up on the related to antitrust monopoly powers of big tech, we do have a huge monopoly problem. We have it in healthcare. And actually COVID bill, COVID relief bill, so, so-called just give billions to big insurance monopolies, not dealing with issues of healthcare costs. You know, and we have the same issue now in big tech where we need to have more transparency. We have a distortion of power where we have big monopolies of information and very ill-informed electorate and people on the ground where information sent to them based on algorithms that people don't even realize. They don't even have a choice how to get information. You cannot go like on TV, pick CNN or Fox News or whatever channel you want. It's sent to you. So it's we need to make sure that we have transparency and need to make sure that we have a, a course if big monopoly is trying to suppress free speech because this is a foundational principle of our a country. So I hope that with a committee, Judiciary Committee, actually have bipartisan support on that issue, and I'll try to work hard with that with my fellow legislators. Congressman Carson had, had to leave, so our remaining group here, uh, as you see, five Republicans from across the state of Indiana. I want to turn one last question here to Congressman Banks. You, you now play a leadership role here within the party as part of uh, the Republican Study Committee. You were kind of front and center a couple weeks ago at CPAC, and obviously a lot of conversation about the future of the Republican Party, right? What does the party look like moving forward in the post-Trump years? How do you bring together different parts of the party that may feel differently about President Trump's time in office? How do you move past what happened at the Capitol, the insurrection, some of the QAnon conspiracy theories that filtered in, into parts of the, the Trump base, perhaps. How do you move forward and win back the majority in 2022? Yeah, well, Dan, uh, when we focus on the issues, when we focus on the agenda, we, the, the contrast is so clear between the radical left that owns the Democrat Party today and the platform and the agenda that Donald Trump in many ways brought to the Republican Party, once again, that made the Republican Party the party of the working class right. for the first time since Ronald Reagan. And that, that's what we have to keep our eye on. We have, to, we have to keep the Republican Party the party of the working class. And I think we do that by marrying the Republican Party, uh, the, the, the party of Ronald Reagan and the, 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 uh, the fundamental conservative values of the party of Ronald Reagan, the, the pro-life and pro-family party, the, the party that understands that a strong military and peace through strength is the best national security strategy. A fiscally conservative uh, 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 party; um, th those are the the part the traditional conservative values of Reagan, and marry that with what President Trump taught us. That when we uh, President Trump, by the way, was the first president of my lifetime, the first president we've had in modern times who uh, took the China threat seriously. They understood that China is the biggest threat that we face today, both economically and militarily. And the Republican Party is on the right side of that issue. The Democrats have turned a, and Joe Biden are, are they're, they're, they're fully willing to turn a blind eye to China while Republicans are addressing the China threat. And, and this issue of big tech uh, free speech censorship, it needs to be a central part of the Republican Party agenda moving forward to give a voice to, to a free speech, a voice to all, of, to all of the American people. I've always said that, do we really have free speech if the left gets to define what Free speech is, of course, of course not. We can't, we can't allow that to happen. And the big tech companies are in bed with the Democrat Party and taking, taking the voices away of conservative people who believe in conservative values. And then, let me say, on top of that, we have a, we have a crisis in America today 
when only when only 52 percent of the American people say they trust our elections. And we have a moral duty in Congress to do something to restore trust in our elections process. And that needs to be a, a key part of a Republican agenda moving forward at the state level, at the federal level, to restore trust in our elections process. So as the chairman of the Republican Study Committee, the largest conservative caucus on Capitol Hill, we've been talking about a consensus <clears throat> uh, agenda that Republicans can, can unite around. And, and what I just described to you is that agenda. And obviously uh, complicated because of so many uh, issues here in the news of what happened uh, at the Capitol that day, obviously the pandemic, uh, a big topic of conversation in the news. And we want to thank you all for uh, sticking around to talk about a lot of those issues here with us tonight for this extended conversation online after our live in focus town hall. Of course, we also want to thank our viewers for watching, joining in on our conversation online as well. There's so many more resources at each of your local stations websites. We invite you to go there, of course, to find more coverage of the pandemic as well as some of the matters we discussed here. Thank you so much for joining us for our in focus path out of the pandemic town hall. Have a great night.